All right, everyone, welcome to our webinar on 2023 System Goals Outcome Data. Uh, this data is helping us to understand our homeless response system's um, impact on the system's level. Uh, really appreciate your engagement in this webinar and hope that it reveals some new insights and sparks ideas for where we as a COC can focus on performance. In this webinar, we are going to cover an overview of the COC system goals and how they're used to measure progress towards the COC shared vision at the system level. We are going to discuss 2023 outcomes data for the Chicago Homeless Response System, as well as highlight data from, um, from this report that we can use to draw insights for our community. Uh, the webinar is meant to serve as an overview of the 2023 system goals report. Um, the highlights that we're sharing today are just some examples of the insights that can be drawn from this data. I definitely encourage folks to engage further with this data by viewing the report, um, which is now available on All Chicago's website and was announced in the newsletter yesterday. Um, so yeah, looking forward to taking you all through it. Um, we'll start off with really the basics. So what are the COC system goals? Uh, so they are the Chicago Homeless Response System's way of using HMAS data to measure system-wide progress towards preventing and ending homelessness in Chicago. Uh, they reveal what our system has accomplished over this past year and provides us with some information on the needs of individuals that are still experiencing homelessness. There are five system goals in our COC. And each goal has its own metrics that are used to measure progress towards that goal. Uh, so just going through them, goal one is to reduce the number of persons experiencing homelessness in Chicago. Goal two is to shorten the length of time persons experience homelessness. Goal three is that units dedicated to using coordinated entry use that system to fill its units. Um, so you utilizing the coordinated entry system. Uh, goal four is to increase the income of adults experiencing homelessness in Chicago through HMAS data. And goal five is that people exit from unsheltered or street homelessness to shelter destinations or housing. Um, and like I said, there are metrics that go along with each of these goals. They're listed here on the slides and we're gonna review each of them in greater depth as we go through the data. Um, but just at a high level, we are looking with goal one at people experiencing homelessness, um, as well as people who are entering COC housing. Um, we are also looking at exits from the COC, the length of time people experience homelessness prior to COC housing, um, the length of time between coordinated entry match and moving into housing at the system level. We're also looking at coordinated entry utilization, um, increases in income in our system, and street outreach enrollments and exits. Uh, in addition to providing those outcomes uh, for the population as a whole, the report also explores data broken down by demographic and other characteristics. So these uh, categories include age, chronic homeless status, which means that a person has been experiencing homelessness for one year or longer over the last three years, uh, also looks at gender, family composition, race and ethnicity, and veteran status. Uh, I'll note that we do have a few updates to our breakdown categories. So our community identified wanting to better understand outcomes for veterans and for individuals of different genders. Um, so gender and veteran status have been added to our report this year. And the race and ethnicity category has also been updated um, because the way in which this information is captured in HMAS was changed by HUD last year. So previously, race and ethnicity were two separate fields. They're now collected in one question. We'll talk a little bit more about um, how this change has impacted our data um, moving forward. Um, a few disclaimers up front um, is that there have been some changes in reporting logic that have affected the outcomes this year. These are all explained in greater depth in the report itself. Um, but a couple of notable ones that I wanted to highlight here uh, is that the active list, which is our understanding of who is experiencing homelessness in Chicago based on HMAS data, has been updated to fully include individuals who are enrolled in coordinated entry um, because these folks are um, considered to be homeless, um, according to HUD's definition. 
Um, and then further, um, as I said earlier, the race and ethnicity category has been updated, um, which we'll talk about both of these changes again um, moving forward. Uh, and then one final disclaimer is that the accuracy of our system goals data um, is greatly impacted by data quality. Uh, the accuracy of these metrics relies on how complete and timely um, the data entered into HMIS is by individual users. Um, and while some of the effects um, of this are really easy to see and understand, such as having a large number of individuals exiting to unknown destinations, um, there's others that are also like less easily recognizable. For example, if individuals housed through permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing projects don't have a housing move-in date entered into HMAS, they're not counted towards the total number of people housed because there are specific HMAS fields um, that trigger when folks are included in these metrics or counted um, as part of these outcomes. Ready. And I'm gonna be moving into um, looking at this data at a glance, but first I want to pause to see if there's any questions um, before we dive on in. And I meant to say this earlier as well, um, but definitely encourage folks um, to engage in this conversation either via the chat. Um, Doug will be monitoring the chat and raising any questions. Um, I'm not sure if there's a raise hand feature in Zoom. Um, we usually use Teams, but if there is, feel free to raise your hand or um, just to come off of mute and share. There, sorry, real quick. There is a raise hand option. It's under reactions, if, if anyone is looking for that. Thank you, Margaret. Doug, anything in the chat that we should field right now? All righty. Thanks folks for introducing yourselves. I see those there as well. Uh, if you haven't yet, please feel free to introduce yourself. Alrighty. So let's now dive look into looking at this data on a high level. Um, again, throughout, I welcome you to engage in conversations. Um, but as a reminder, the methodologies for calculating each of these metrics is included in the reports. I would definitely direct um, any initial questions on those there, um, but we're happy to discuss those pieces further here. If there's really in-depth questions um, and you're interested in really getting into the nitty gritty, I also invite you to reach out um, to myself, um, to Doug. Um, we can um, sort those through with you. Uh, but let's kick off by talking about how many people are experiencing homelessness in Chicago as indicated by HMAS data in 2023. So on an average day, there were about 11,767 people who were experiencing homelessness. Uh, we also refer to this number as the active list um, because it counts people who are actively experiencing homelessness while engaging in Chicago's homeless response system. Uh, this active list includes individuals that are engaged in street outreach, emergency shelter, transitional housing, and coordinated entry. It also includes people who are enrolled in permanent housing projects before that housing move-in date, if their living situation is recorded as homeless prior to then. Um, also includes individuals in other projects if their living situation in HMAS assisted as homeless, uh, as well as those that have recently ex exited a project to a homeless or unknown destination. So that's how we are measuring um, individuals who are experiencing homelessness in Chicago through HMAS data. And then we also have a metric that measures the number of people who are newly experiencing homelessness. So each month in 2023, an average of 1,143 people were newly experiencing homelessness. Uh, and this is defined as being new to that active list for the first time in two years. And uh, again, looking at things on a high level, um, let's talk about housing outcomes. So as a note, whenever we use the term like house, uh, COC housing on the slides or in the re report, it refers to all housing projects that enter data into HMAS, regardless of their funding stream. So not only those that are funded through COC funding. But in 2023, there were 1,536 people who were counted as being housed in permanent housing projects in HMAS, 
On average, those people had experienced homelessness for 843 days prior to moving into COC housing. For projects committed to using coordinated entry, 82% were, were filled using coordinated entry matches. Um, and after being matched, it took households an average of 84 days to move into housing. So that's kind of the way in which um, we see people moving through the system. We see this number of people being housed. Um, prior to that housing, they've experienced homelessness for over 800 days. Um, and then for folks who were referred through coordinated entry, there is 84 days between that referral date and the time they actually move into housing. Um, I see a question or a comment. Yes. Hi, hey everyone. Um, this is Doug Nichols from all Chicago. And we've got a great question in the chat from uh, from Jillian. And I'll I'll recap it, but but also feel free to come off of, of mute, Jillian, if you'd like, um, which is this question for our for that active list number. Um, just if you can hop back in that slide one real quick. You know, does this, uh, as we all know, we've had many people come to Chicago as migrants. Um, and there are shelters that, that DFSS has supported, the city has supported. So the question is, is that included in this number? Um, and the answer is that no, those specific shelters from DFSS are not part of this HMIS system um, and so are not included in that number. That said, we also know that you know many people who are migrants um, probably are accessing the system, the main um, uh, shelters and other parts of our system in, in other manners, um, but it's not something that we can quantify in any, any way. Um, and sh yeah, sorry, Jesse, I'll let, go ahead, Shannon, and then Jesse, I'll let you call on people. Thanks for this presentation. Yeah, I, I can just share that um, based off of the 2023 pit, there were some new arrivals in the Chicago shelter system. I believe it was about like around 200, 250 people, um, just for some context. And because, you know, the new arrival shelters that are, you know, functioning in our system aren't in HMIS, you're, what, what Doug had shared is, is correct. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Shannon. Appreciate the context. Um, and highlights even more that this is a conversation about this data, so thank you. Uh, Kathy? Yeah, thanks for this data. I just wondered how this um, 11,767 number compares with that point in time number. That is a great question and not something I have compared. Shannon, do you care to share? Yeah, this is the total number, correct? And sheltered and unsheltered. This is a daily average of folks who are experiencing, and yes, any type of homelessness according to HMAS. Okay, so it's not like a capture point in time from one specific day. So that, that's one difference to keep in mind, I think. Um, the 2023 pit count was a snapshot on the third Thursday of January in 2023. And I will also just link the data to our report and one pager around the pit count. We're gonna be releasing our 2024 results at the end of this month to HUD and then doing some reporting about that as well later into the spring. So you can keep a lookout on the city's website, but in total comparison, there are 6,140 people that were estimated to be experiencing homelessness on that night in 2023 in January. About 5,100 were in sheltered situations, so emergency shelters, transitional housing, or safe havens, and then almost 1,000 were in unsheltered locations last year. Yeah. So if I can quickly call out our responses, this is Doug again. Um, and yeah, and as, as Shannon just pointed out, the, the specifics of that pit count are people who are unsheltered and in those shelters uh, types that Shannon just described. Uh, as Jesse said earlier, this this count is a little broader than that and includes um, all types of of HUD defined homelessness that we have captured within HMIS. So we have people from our coordinated entry system that may not be present in one of those other types that are included here, and um, a few other um, data points that we are able to include in this number that 
are just you know, different than the PITS methodology. See another hand raised from Mark. Yeah, thank you. I'm just curious if there's been any back and forth with the Coalition for the Homeless on their number, which I think is closer to like 60,000. I've seen it quoted in the press. Um, how do the counts differ? And is there sort of a quick and easy explanation that can help the COC members understand, you know, what the differences are when we're all, you know, doing advocacy in our own worlds? Yeah, so we are in communication with the coalition about their numbers. Um, they also received some data from HMAS and work with us um, to really help to make sure that they're representing that accurately. Um, I would say the quickest answer, um, perhaps the least nuanced one, is that um, their numbers also include estimations of individuals experiencing doubled up homelessness, um, where that is not a category of homelessness under HUD's definition. Um, so we're looking mainly at those um, four categories. Um, the first one being literally homeless, um, also looks at individuals fleeing domestic violence, individuals who um, are at imminent risk of losing housing and individuals who are considered homeless under other federal or local statutes, um, which I believe I said this correctly. There may be some errors in that, but um, so yeah, that's the main difference is that they're also including an estimation of individuals who are living doubled up. I believe they also, it's not like a point in time capture of one night either. So the way in which the data are cleaned and calculated is slightly different for the coalition of the of the homeless. Um, so it's just, yeah, pit count is one night and then the coalition does it kind of over uh, the entire year to try and get an estimate. And I think they use some census data as well to try and create their estimates. But Doug, you probably know a little bit more about that. Oh yeah, I see a thumbs up, that's good. <laughs> yes, thank you. Hey, right. any other questions right now on this um, this estimate or the housing outcomes? We'll dive a little bit more into um, data over time as well as um, individual like breakdown categories. So we'll have further opportunities to discuss them as well. I'll move right along then um, to looking at individuals who are exiting our system in HMAS. Uh, so this includes exits from all project types, not just housing projects. Um, and this slide in allows us to see the breakdown of the types of destinations to which people are exiting homeless or exiting um, HMAS. Uh, and then the most notable thing um, on here is that the vast majority, 85% of exits from our COC are to unknown destinations. Um, this proportion has increased over time. So for comparison in 2021, only 68% of exits were unknown. Um, and while some data on exits is always gonna be unknown, um, this high rate is like far beyond what should be expected. Um, as I mentioned earlier, data quality plays a big role. Uh, this issue is fixable with improved data quality and timeliness and would help us to understand how people are moving through our homeless response system more effectively. Um, and then again, moving through this quick overview um, is that system goal four looks at income. It shows us that of the adults served in HMAS, 5% had an increase in employment income recorded over the past year. And in 2023, 13% had increased their cash benefits income. Um, this includes income from sources such as SSI and SSDI, retirement income, and other non-employment sources of income. And then um, our last system goal, system goal five, looks specifically at street outreach programs. In 2023, there were just over 10,000 people who were enrolled in street outreach at some point during the year. Uh, 2,867 of these people had a recorded exit at some point in the year. Um, if we look to the graphic that's on the right, it's represented by that blue box, which shows that 29% of people who were enrolled um, had at least one exit during the year. 
Uh, and then the red in the graphic represents the proportion of people who exited street outreach to a shelter destination. So that could be to an emergency shelter, it could be to housing or any other um, destination that is not unsheltered homelessness. And that represents 40% of all the exits um, that occurred during the year. So next I'm gonna be moving into highlights, but again, pausing. Um, I went through those last three um, goals pretty quickly. Any questions? All right. If not, let's transition into talking about some trends over time um, and some highlights from this data. Uh, so figuring out like what insights can we really draw? Again, these are just some examples of the insights that can be drawn from all the data in the report. Um, and these are ones that are also highlighted in the report. Um, so first, uh, HMAS demonstrates that the demand for housing far exceeds available housing resources in our COC. So by taking averages from two of our metrics and comparing them, we can estimate that on a single day in Chicago, that while four people moved into COC housing projects, that 38 became newly homeless. Um, that's a great disparity and action is needed to increase funding for housing programs and also to expand affordable housing options across the city um, so that COC housing, HMS housing is not the only form through which people are housed. Any questions on that comparison there? Um, then I'll highlight next um, how one of these methodology changes that we discussed earlier has impacted our estimate of how many people are experiencing homelessness in Chicago. So in September of 2022, um, the active list um, logic was updated to fully include people who were enrolled in coordinated entry. Um, so for this reason, we did see a jump from 2022 to 2023. Um, which is due at least in part to this shift in logic. Um, so it's important to call that out um, just so we're all aware that the active list numbers are not perfectly comparable from year to year, um, but that this new number um, is inclusive of those individuals enrolled through coordinated entry. Um, and then these logic changes have also impacted our understanding of who is new to the active list or new to homelessness each month. Um, and that overtime comparison is included here. We see um, a smaller jump, um, but it's still important to note that these are not perfectly comparable year to year. Uh, our next highlight is that the number of people who have moved into housing projects has decreased over the last couple of years. So. From 2021, we see um, that spike, that high number. Um, and then actually from 2021 to 2023, uh, the number housed has decreased by 42%. Um, so multiple factors are likely contributing to this decrease. Um, for one, staffing shortages might be limiting providers' ability to inflow new participants into this program or into their programs. Uh, and then additionally, the utilization of permanent supportive housing units may be contributing to this decrease. Uh, the average utilization rates have slightly decreased over the past few years, which means that each month there are more units that are left open. Uh, the COC is working on addressing PSH utilization and has a goal of improving it in PSH projects, particularly among projects that do not receive COC funding, which seem to be driving this lower utilization. Um, this graph shows the average length of time people experiencing people experience homelessness prior to COC housing. Um, and we see that this number is fluctuating over the past few years. Uh, there was an increase in the length of time homeless um, from 2022 to 2023 um, and this in magnitude of like just over one month. 
Um, while this increase does demonstrate that people are experiencing homelessness for longer, it also indicates to us that people who have been experiencing homelessness for longer are being housed through our system. So that's just those numbers over time for that comparison to get a feel. We included it for all of our metrics here. Um, system goal three, again, looks at the percent of committed units that were filled through coordinated entry matches. Um, so over the past few years, we have seen the proportion um, dropping from 91% in 2021 with that middle bar, 88% in 2022, and 82% in 2023. Um, All Chicago does serve as the coordinated entry lead agency for this UOC and is working with the coordinated entry leadership team to understand um, what the barriers are to utilizing coordinated entry um, and identifying some opportunities to provide technical assistance to providers um, to improve this rate of coordinated entry use in the COC. Uh, and then after being matched to housing in 2023, it took an average of 84 days for people to move into that housing, or rather for households to move into that housing. Um, this time has been slightly increasing over the past few years, um, as can be seen on this graph. Um, from 2021 to 2023, there being an increase of nine days. Yes. Hey, Jesse, thank you for walking us through all this. I wanted to call out to ask, um, we've had some great conversational questions, I think, in the chat. I've tried to answer some of the more specific ones, but I wanted to ask uh, Jillian or, or Juanita, would you, either of you be interested in coming off of mute and asking those questions? And we can hop back to the slide that it referred to. Why don't we start with you, Juanita? Hi. Um, yeah, so my question was just that um, the numbers um, that you show for the individuals going into housing versus those are newly becoming um, unhoused, do we have any numbers for the reasons for those people becoming unhoused? Like, are they addictions, foreclosures, domestic violence? Do we know ages? Um, because then maybe, you know, those are maybe some things proactively that could, you know, be looked at, like people that are on, on list for evictions or foreclosures or, you know, just, um, I guess I'm just, you know, thinking about, of course, preventing prevention is always going to, um, you know, be better than trying to, you know, find people, homeless people, and go through a whole system of finding a new place if you're already in a place, keeping a person housed. I know that's not always, um, you know, a, a viable solution, but, um, you know, just wondering if we have any data on that or what are, do we look at that at all? That's a great question, Juanita. Um, and I'll say that through system goals data, we have some data that we have access to that we make available um, for all of the metrics. So one of those that you mentioned being age, we also provide it for um, veteran status, for gender, for race, ethnicity, for all of those um, breakdown categories that are in the report. Um, further reasons um, that persons have become homeless is not something that um, is currently captured in this metric. Um, so yes, it's not something that we currently have the means of understanding through this data. Uh, Jillian, if you were interested in coming off of mute, um, I know you've been very active in the chat. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, there's a couple things I wanted to lift to the group. I think action is needed. Like, I think I know that prevention is a goal of the COCs, but I do think that like this prevention issue is going to kind of 
address some of this disparity of four people moving into housing and 38 newly homeless? Like if they're not going to be newly homeless, we'll see that decrease. So I'm curious, like what are the prevention like actions and activities that the COC is considering related to this? The other thing that I was curious about is when we're looking at delays from match to housing, like what is contributing to that delay? Because I like, you know, I find it, I, I understand that we look at the, these numbers and they seem abstract, but like to be unhoused for 80 days while waiting for, um, like for housing that you should have, like, I understand that there's like paperwork and all of that, but like to see it increase to me is unacceptable. So like what exactly are the actions and activities of the COC to make sure that network wide, this is not continuing, that the trend up is not continuing. Yeah, thank you for raising um, those pieces. And I um, had also see, saw you highlight in the chat um, the, um, the EHI, the Expedited Housing Initiative. Um, and I think that speaks to just how many factors are really influencing these numbers and that this is something that we're understanding on a system level. Um, these are the numbers that we have right now. And then really the COC is tasked with um, working to understand what those contributing factors are, identifying strategies um, for ways to improve um, the outcomes that we are seeing. So some of that work um, right now is being done through the uh, COC State and Performance Committee, which operates under the SOPC Systems Operation and Performance Committee. Um, they're engaging in a process of reviewing system goals data, identifying opportunities for improvement and transforming those into strategies. Um, the first of which um, looks um, at um, reducing length of time homelessness. Um, so all that to say is that what these numbers allow us to do is to have more conversations about um, the outcomes that we're seeing and definitely um, encouraging folks to continue to have those conversations to figure out strategies for improvement. Um, Doug or Margaret, would either of you like to speak to other aspects of the Jillian's I think question? I think your prevention question is a is a great one and a, a big one in scope that I I am neither the most qualified person in, in the COC to answer, um, nor do I think that that's, I mean, I, I think it's a big scope question. We, we have prevention efforts. We have programs that are targeted towards prevention, um, obviously things like state homeless prevention dollars. Um, and I'm, I'm, it's a great question, question to note and one I, I hope you keep, keep raising. Um, and yeah. But like that's about all I know right now. Um, Shannon, maybe you have insights on any of this. Um, I just had a follow up question that I I think could be helpful. And you know, DFSS, we look at your system goal data and compare it to the data that we have from our delegates to try and understand these trends over time. And one thing that when looking at this, I was thinking about um, is like by program model. So like by rapid rehousing and like permanent supportive housing, as an example, how this number varies. And I think having that understanding of some of the nuance by program type could be really helpful for the COC to look into more. I don't know if you have. Um, having those all grouped together, I think, you know, we know there's system constraints that are at play in our, in our city with like access to the demand for housing in general and access to affordable units is really limited. And so I think some of those system constraints are definitely at play in some of the trends that we've seen post pandemic, especially with like, you know, federal supports coming to an end and a variety of other things. But I wonder if slicing the data in that way, it could be a helpful way to kind of understand from a system perspective as well. Yeah, that's a fantastic thing to raise, Shannon. And um, in helpful news, hopefully, um, so similarly to how veteran status and gender were identified as ways in which folks wanted to look more into this data, and it's been added to this report. Um, in 2024, we are adding project type um, to our list of breakdown categories so that we can look at that data a little more closely. And that'll start being released um, with the six-month report. 
So thanks for raising it. Uh, Julian? Hi, I might be getting ahead of myself. I think one of the questions that I'm curious about is one, when we look at the ratio of people being housed versus becoming homeless, I think one of the questions that I have for the group is like, um, demographically, is there an overrepresentation of a particular group in becoming homeless? And is there something to pay attention to related to that? And if that disparity or inequity has increased over time? The other thing that I've raised in the chat that I'm curious about is what we're what we know about the asylum seeker crisis is that it is not going anywhere. And it is likely to increase over the summer, especially as we run up to the DNC. So one of my questions is, like, from a network perspective, while we assume that there are people that are, like, asylum seekers who are currently in and getting services from projects that are funded through the COC, I kind of feel like there might need to be a conversation related to, like, tracking that, because the reality is that, like, that system and this system at some point are going to merge. At least that's the goal with the new chief homelessness officer, as well as the similar role that's at the state level is kind of this integration instead of this siloed approach. So I'm curious, like what steps are you thinking about for 2024 related to that? Because again, it is not going anywhere. And I believe that street outreach workers who are saints, in my opinion, like they don't delineate between who is or is not a citizen. They're really trying to get people to the places that they want to go. And so what I've heard from street outreach people is that for people who are asylum seekers, a lot of them, I know this, the party line is take them to the landing zone, but a lot of them are not, they've already been there. They're not interested in going to city run shelter and going somewhere else. So I'm just curious, like what the thinking is around this. I understand like, tracking people who are not necessarily citizens yet has its own kind of um, risk. But I'm just curious how this, like the COC in terms of outcomes is thinking about it. Yeah, um, I would say that um, for the purposes of this reporting and the mechanisms that we currently have, um, for a lot of the reasons that you raised and the difficulties of data collection and the considerations that go into that, that um, that status is not something that is currently um, recorded in HMAS. So um, it's not something that we currently have the ability to track on kind of the system-wide level through these means, um, but that it is a growing consideration, especially as you alluded to, like the merging of the shelter systems in the coming times. And it's something that definitely the community is um, needs needs to look at um, in the way that we are collecting information on this and really drawing insights. Um, as Jillian did, I, I opened it up um, to the group. Um, to answer the other part of your question, I guess, Jillian, is that we are gonna go into some data highlights on the demographic breakdown. So hopefully that provides a little bit more information on um, how different populations um, are experiencing these outcomes. But yeah, I'll raise it to um, one or two responses to anything that um, Julian said and then move forward so that we can get through all the content. I will say since the demographic breakdowns um, in this presentation don't include the new arrivals, Currently, the pick count data from last year and that will be released this year does have demographic information on the new arrivals that were estimated um, to be experiencing homelessness the night of the count. So that can be an interesting resource. And then the report does have some, you know, information around the surveys and findings for that specific subpopulation. So if you're curious to understand a little bit more, um, around the local context of that population, I encourage you to look at it. And I think it's one of those things, Jillian, with our system, there's a lot of efforts taking place, as you know, and I think it's something that everyone is thinking about and the state is kind of leading the efforts on moving forward. So um, 
you know, it's good to draw attention to the current situation and potential need in the future as we get into warmer months, so. Yeah, Shannon, thank you for that response. Um, I'll move forward then um, to talking about our data highlights from these demographic breakdowns. So they've also revealed some insights. Um, lots of these are called out in the reports highlight section and the data itself can be found in the reports appendix. So we're gonna highlight here as many as we have time for as some examples, but again, would highly encourage folks to view the report to draw additional highlights from this disaggregated data that we have. Um, so when we look to who is being served by Chicago's homeless response system from a race and ethnicity lens, uh, we see that it is primarily individuals that are Black or African American, um, with 72% of folks on the active list being Black or African American and white, Hispanic, Latino, white, um, another race or ethnicity, two or more races or ethnicities, and no response um, trailing behind that. Um, I'll, I'll note here that it is difficult to compare race and ethnicity from 2023 to prior years, again, to the, due to these updates in the HMAS data standards that I referenced earlier. So again, in the past, race and ethnicity were collected as separate data elements beginning in October of last year. These elements were combined and now allow individuals to select multiple answers to align with their racial or ethnic identity. Um, so as a result, many of the individuals that were listed previously as black or white are now included in the multiple races or ethnicities categories in reflection of that selected identity that um, they now have the capacity to enter. But that being said, uh, this proportion does remain a stark contrast to the city's overall population, um, where when comparing to census data, Black or African-American individuals make up only 29% of Chicago's population. Um, so on an average day in Chicago, while roughly one in every 229 Chicagoans experience homelessness, roughly one in 91 Black Chicagoans did. Um, and these are rough comparisons based on two different data sets. Um, it's meant to provide a general understanding of the difference. It's not an exact statistic. However, this discrepancy does really underscore the unique barriers that Black Chicagoans face in securing stable housing. Um, the COC does remain dedicated to fostering racial equity, both on an individual level through programs and through systems approaches um, that are really driven by the racial equity line of action in the COC. And I agree with those folks in the chat and raise up even more that the need um, among Black African Americans in the city is um, great in respect to this and even more of a reason that we really need to be emphasizing racial equity moving forward in our improvement efforts. Um, Jillian? Yeah, I apologize. I clicked the wrong reaction and was clapping. Do not clap this. So my question is like, what is this ratio of one of every 229 and one in 91? Like, what is that looking like year over year? Cause I can appreciate this in one year, but mm -hmm. are we improving? So it's like last year it was roughly one in 150 black Chicagoans. And then we've shrunk that or has this ratio increased? Because a lot of the metrics that you've shared previously have shown longer wait times, more people going into un being unhoused. So I'm curious, like, are we improving this inequity at a systems level? I think it's a great question. And it's a difficult one to answer for two reasons. Um, so or for multiple reasons, but primarily um, two. So the change in the HUD data standards again, made it difficult to compare race and ethnicity data year to year. Um, additionally, the change in the active list and, and just changing the universe um, by which people are considered homelessness in this state, homeless in this data has also made that difficult. So while this is a comparison we were able to draw this year, we have not done the same um, in previous years. 
Um, but I hope that it's one that we continue to do moving forward to really track how um, the interventions that are taking place are making an impact on this disparity. I just want to make one suggestion, you know, as you know, the system integration conversations and everything move forward. Um, I think it'll be important to be able to have a variable that allows for RCOC to understand clients that are new arrivals, migrants, asylum seekers that get entered into HMIS moving forward versus, um, you know, the non-asylum seeker population. Of course, totals are important, but I think similar to when we started to incorporate that for the point in time count last year, having the subpopulation information and being able to look at it, the historic trends over time will be really important. And so having that designation in HMIS will be, I think, an essential part of that. Thank you for raising that. Um, and uh, we'll highlight at the end as well, but all of the opportunities to become involved in committees and really raise up those pieces. So. Um, HMIS committee, systems operations performance committee, um, the data and performance committee, all working on pieces like this and figuring out what data needs to be captured and how that data should be presented. Um, so yes, encourage you all to raise those there and it will also be something that um, I'll note and continue to think on too. Alrighty, so we have 10 minutes left. So I'm gonna move through these next few quickly just so that we do have time for um, questions at the end. Um, but Shannon or Jillian, you had asked the question about um, what populations we see growing among those who are new to homelessness. Um, youth ages 18 to 24 is one of them. Um, so over the past five years, the proportion of homeless youth has been increasing. Um, from 6% in 2019, um, slowly incrementally increasing to 13% in 2023. Um, and it's, it is important to note, while it's not on the slide, that the rate at which this group has been accessing housing resources through the COC is also increasing, uh, with 18% of people being housed in HMAS being youth. Um, so while the number of homeless youth has been increasing, the COC has been responsive to this growing population through providing housing services. Uh, the next two slides highlight um, groups that experience tend to experience longer lengths of time homeless prior to being housed through the COC. Um, so in 2023, the COC's Data and Performance Committee, which again operates under SOPC, worked on identifying strategies to decrease length of time experiencing homelessness overall with a specific focus on groups that experience homelessness for longer. Um, this committee's work is gonna continue through 2024, but the first of these groups that were identified was is single adults. Um, so single adults who move into COC housing on average experience significantly longer lengths of time homeless, um, one over a thousand days compared to families, which experience just over 300 days um, prior to being housed on average. Um, so again, this disparity is great, um, or it's large, I'll phrase it that way. Um, and it's be even more important than ever to really focus on the ways in which um, single adults are being provided um, assistance through um, our homeless response system. Um, another group that experiences longer lengths of time homeless overall is transgender and gender nonconforming individuals. Um, so this data is revealed by one of our new breakdown categories, gender. Um, compared to other gender groups, trans and gender nonconforming individuals who move into COC housing have the longest average length of time homeless at just over 1,200 days. Um, and then men also experience homelessness for 149 days longer than women on average. So um, uh, providing this new um, data breakdown category allows us to see new insights in our data um, and it's been provided. Um, and then the last point I'm gonna make here or highlight here is related to our other new breakdown category, uh, which shows that veterans show improved outcomes compared to non-veterans. Uh, so while veterans make up about 5% of the people experiencing homelessness overall, 
Um, they also made up about 15% of the people housed through the COC. Um, veterans are also more likely than non-veterans to exit to permanent destinations, um, with 16% exiting to permanent destinations compared to 7% of non-veterans. They also tend to experience shorter lengths of time homeless prior to being COC housed. So um, veterans experience an average of 575 days homeless compared to over 900 days for non-veterans. Um, this data likely demonstrates that services specifically set up for veterans have been effective at promoting improved outcomes for this population in our COC. And again, quickly just moving through these last few slides, and then I'll open it up for anybody to raise any questions on any of the data that I presented throughout. Um, but talking about what's next for system goals. So we've alluded to a few of these points, um, but we have a couple of new metrics that we will be looking at. Um, so where metric 1.1 presents that kind of that um, average of individuals who are on the active list on a given day, um, we're also going to be looking at a metric um, that provides the total number that appeared on the active list in the time span. So um, this time next year, we'll also have a count of individuals who were experiencing homelessness in 2024 who appeared on that active list, not as an average. Uh, we'll also be looking at returns to homelessness, which looks at specifically individuals that have exited to permanent destinations from the COC um, and the rate at which they um, become homeless again through HMAS data um, at different time intervals. So specifically looking at after folks exit to permanent destinations, um, what percent return within six months or within 12 months. Uh, we'll also be revising um, the increase in income metrics, so 4.1 and 4.2, um, to paint, uh, paint a better picture of um, how income is being increased in our system, hopefully provide us with some new insights there. Um, and then, as we said already, um, we'll be adding a project type breakdown category. Um, all of these are going to become available starting in 2024, so look out for those future reports. Um, to learn more about the 2023 system goals, again, um, we'll really highlight that all of this data is included in the full report. Um, the link is there. Doug, if you could also put that in the chat if you haven't. Um, there's also all past and future data reports can be found on the HMS data reports page on All Chicago's website. All Chicago's website also has an HMAS data dashboard, which provides more regular updates on um, HMAS data. And as I highlighted earlier, COC committees, affinity groups um, are wonderful ways to get involved in these types of conversations to really see how can we take understanding our outcomes into acting on our outcomes to work towards improvement. Um, and those can all be found on the COC calendar, which um, we'll send out the slides um, following this meeting um, that these will all be linked here, but they can also all be found on all Chicago's website. And then finally, I want to thank you all for participating in today's webinar. Um, your feedback um, is really important to us and helps us to continue to provide um, these learning opportunities for um, the community. So we ask that you please complete um, the survey that I've linked here. Doug, if you could share that in the chat as well. Um, whether you are here with us viewing this live webinar or viewing the recording of the webinar, um, would really, really appreciate if you all could fill out that survey. It's pretty brief. Um, and with that, um, I just want to thank you all again for coming here today, um, contributing your time, contributing your thoughts, your questions to this conversation. Um, I have found it really engaging uh, to talk about these pieces. And with the remaining time that we have, I'll open it up to any further questions or discussions. Um, but if anyone needs to hop off, that's all right as well. Yeah, Juanita. Hi, okay, so I'm still kind of stuck on that. I think it was 64% or 62% of people exiting. We don't know where they're going. Um, okay. like, is there something 
planned for that to to kind of figure out what's happening how i mean I, so I, i'll just say I'll, let me back up i'm i'm new to this um homelessness um um ecosystem what, what a, a, almost two years um but from what i how do people leave the system do they just don't do they just not say where they're going is that not something like an exit interview i mean what what happens that we can't understand where what's happening to them yeah that's a great question um there's a few different ways in which people can be considered to have gone to an unknown destination so one of them is that the person entering data into hmas whether it be that person's caseworker or another person at the agency says that they just didn't collect that information from the participant or that the participant left without an exit interview or the person didn't know to where they were exiting. Um, that's one way. Um, another way is when folks do not have an updated, um, any updated information in HMAS um, for a long period of time, they can also be considered to have exited from that project. So for example, if somebody is engaged in a project, there's no updates on them for over a year. Um, our, in our data, we're not considering that person to be um, in that project anymore, which again speaks to the importance of data quality to make sure that if folks are exiting projects that their profile isn't just like left open or their enrollment isn't just left open, that we are actually capturing to where they've exited to. Or if that person is really still engaged that over that time, there should be some sort of update and there is a required update that should be given on things like that person's um, status in the project um, or any assessments that should have been given in that time period. So Anita, I hope that answers um, your question on why that number is so high or at least where it's coming from. Um, yeah, I guess it does. I guess my next question there was, I mean, do, is there is there any interest in in that being better? Because it just seems like if the goal is to house people and to permanently house people and 85% of the people are leaving and you don't know where they're going, like, are we, do we know what's really like the result? Are these people returning back to homelessness and being recycled back through the system. I'm, I, I, I guess that's just a lot to me, um, a, a, a huge number, I guess that's all. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And I think it um, highlights the need to really focus on data quality um, and understanding how do we use HMS to paint an accurate picture of what's happening to folks um, in our system. So. I totally agree with you, Anita, and I, yes, I think that this really should be an area in which it is highlighted. And um, there are ways in which our system is working to improve data quality. Um, so yes, I am in agreement with you. Um, I'll highlight that we are over um, the time that we stated for the webinar. So if any folks have any additional questions, I have some time after this, happy to stay on with you.